I mean, she told me lots of times, but I, I guess I wasn't listening. Left handed? Yeah. yeah. That's funny how in French that it's gauche. <laughs> well, then uh, there's a different meaning in English for gauche. Yeah, I know. But it's kind of a negative connotation. When it's interesting just... in Latin, it's sinister. Oh, yeah. See, so there you go. Because it was thought it was being a devil way to be left handed. Yeah, sinister. Yeah. yeah. When I was a kid, they tried to teach me to write right handed with a pencil. Yeah. When I was a kid, they tried to teach me how to do it left handed. And I didn't do very well. Oh, I thought you were saying you're left-handed. I am. I just don't write very well. Oh, you're right. Okay. You tried to teach you to write, and you couldn't do it. And they failed differently. Yeah. Yeah. Too, and that was kind of write it in ink, and then just scrape it all up. It was all the way there. Yeah, yeah. And some people wrote this way. Yes. And some people wrote this way. It's because you, you drag your hand across the table. Well, yeah. So cool. I turn my book sideways, as you can see, because mm -hmm. I yeah write it to the ink. Yeah, that's right. We should. We jump it the other way. But some, people, but some people would write like this, yeah. like over the top. And some people would write like up from the bottom. To avoid the ink. Yeah. The sister is left handed and everything she writes is tilted left. Open your palms. Yeah. 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 So and that's the that, yeah. So that she doesn't trace with the Yeah. Yeah. She probably writes from the That's why they did this. It's kind of wonderful. Yeah. 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 Uh, no one can tell if you're left or right handed. Some of the best golfers are left handed to play right handed. Yeah. Yeah. And then Mike Ware is right handed to play left handed. You know, well, I, just, I didn't yeah. know. That's so you can buy cheaper clubs, right? It's more rare to be right. Um, that that is Tommy Miller is left handed. But Jordan Speed is left handed. Yeah. It's all these guys so, that you know wanted to get a discount right. on the clubs. Mm -hmm. They'll you know, wait till the year end sale and then they go buy all the left. Yeah, they like never have hardly yeah. ever been used. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, what you thought great when Colin was here because there was a surplus. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, his father would take the double in and he would be standing across the room to take the double. I'm only reporting what I read. That's three o'clock. So, the idea uh, today was. Maybe the first 30 minutes in case there are any golf course issues or anything they wanted to discuss. And then from 3 30 on, we'd be just not getting a course or project from Weaver Technical. So certainly Weaver owns Weaver Technical. His principal technician is Aaron Wall. And Aaron's been here since really good in the week. Um, you know, this is being recorded for Michael and the two members that I can attend. The idea would be. This is a bit of a primer for the next meeting. It's coming up on the 21st because we'll explore the quiet update. But this also gives you enough information to distract the three or the main message. Yeah. I find it, find it difficult to follow their, their process or maybe their way they quote and estimate jobs. So they should see how they do this mm -hmm. presentation today. But you know, when I look at the quotes, it's very hard to kind of follow is where we are, what we stand, what's left on standing. Mm -hmm. But I've also not been able to focus as much attention on this as I would like, just because of you know, being at the GM from whenever to April. I just didn't have the time to mm -hmm. focus on this. And I knew it wasn't coming up, so I kind of had to partition things that weren't eminently important to me. Yeah. As you can relate when you're important, but not urgent. Not urgent. Yeah, there you go. Or the matters. We're in triage mode. Well, I yeah. asked I asked Craig in his capacity as the president. Like I, I said, I would like to have it go through Link's committee okay. at our meeting on the 21st so that it can go to the board on March 7th, so that it can go to the AGM. Because the previous approval oh, is the board, sir. The board is March 7th. Because the previous approval is now stale dated, according to our bylaws. If you don't, if you get approval for a project and you don't do it within three years, you have to come back and get it reapproved again. So that's the situation we're in. One of the challenges we're going to add to was when this might before we started is that the capital budget as proposed by Lakes and finance is getting. 
because the definition of restricted capital is unclear. And so at least one or more of the finance committee is challenging the definition of restricted capital. So with the challenge and not being absolutely clear, really the only responsible decisions to be no capital projects as opposed to clear spending rights restricted and unrestricted. And then what's enveloped in that Allison is that design falls into the category that according to bylaws is not allowed to be paid for restricted capital. So that means you have to pay for all your design work that are offering. But then how do you pay for the design work that are offering without a quick operating budget? And then how do you how do you have and how is this gonna work? Can I, well, we're just, so you, you can't get a project cost until you do the design. So it's a little bit like you're stuck between chicken and egg. So Richard's gonna request the clarification of that because he does feel that. For sure, for example, and major projects would fall under street capital because you've got to get this to be able to get a price. You've got to be able to get a price to get it approved. So it's a caveat, really, you know, never ending cycle. It's the design phase of the project. Yes, and that's his argument. But that eventually would get folded into the project cost. Yeah. Yes, sir. So when did this happen that you went to? Finance and then two weeks ago, or a Monday ago, I don't know, no cost. I think it was last Monday. So I did a presentation on mix as a practice. So I went right, right, right. and then I just said well, here's capital, but it doesn't exactly run up with Richard's capital. So here's capital. It was about six hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of capital projects that could be. I think we pared it down to something like three fifty, but it's, and that included foreshore design and the irrigation plan. And the reason why I was asking for the irrigation design to be included. Is that we're going to be redoing the entire foot and fairway? We're going to be elevating the foot and fairway. Look, so your entire irrigation system is going to be very understanding. And you could just extend those stripper heads up and call it good. But I think it's the ideal opportunity to redo one fairway and show you what the new system would be like. So you might as well design the whole system because the vibe is going to plug in four and it's going to plug in the rest of the golf course. So what you do with five is going to require engineering and it's going to require design. So again, a great opportunity to. Build your irrigation design into the Porsche project. One of the benefits of the Porsche project, the way we initially designed it, was it's called a hard short system. So it's armor, stone, big, big, massive production and permanent. Farmer Fishery Motions said, We will not allow you to do that. Now we get up to the soft short. So the hard short program was more expensive. The soft short is going to be less expensive. So there's a benefit. It won't be as permanent because every 20 years or so, you're going to have to go in and fix the shoreline. But at least we're going to have a way to get in and out of there, and there's going to be a starting off point for it. You're not going to use it. And so that gives you a little more money within that project to do the 13, to do the 14, to do the 15, to do the irrigation system in that hole if you want to do it as part of the project. And we initially told members there's going to be 1.25 million. Is the budget going to be around the size of 1.5 million? If we did greens rebuilding, we get in a okay. longer plan. Because the other thing we have to consider is that. If you're closing three, four, and five, or parts of three, parts of four, parts of five to do this project, is there a missed opportunity cost not fixing three to three, not fixing four to three, and not fixing five to three? Is there things that you would love to get done while those things are closing? And we're with other architects, so that's going to be a good point on the answer. And maybe there just isn't only self-opportunity cost. Like a lot of times when you got a one month project like building for sure, that's not enough time for you to do. A bunch of other projects, but the question has to be asked. So when somebody comes back and says, Well, why didn't you rebuild the fourth green? Why didn't you rebuild? The well, you were in there, you're in there. You say, Well, we didn't have the time, or it wasn't part of the scope that we wanted to do, but yes, we took the problem. Yeah, I have a supplemental. Mm -hmm. uh, with the redoing sort of the fifth fairway, is that an opportunity to install or plan again? Right. Absolutely, yes. It's a great question. Like, that's perfect. One of the seminars I'm going to next week is regrass and golf course. So, the woman that I've been trying to get out of her name is Dr. Ruth Long. She lives in Oregon Island or has family in Oregon Island, but she's the PhD she that does all the seed research for North America. So, when Cabot or Bandon or Chambers Bay or the Club in Rio de Janeiro got built, they flew her there. She picked the grass pieces and then She's the first and then you showed me some videos yeah, of sort yeah. of a middle-aged to older squatting woman. Yeah, and she was out with um Dan and Elliot on her crash club and she did a video. And what the video was basically saying, because it was kind of framed around our nationalizers. So she's on the golf course with 
Dan Allen was in Chicago when I got to play. And Dan said, thank you, open with all your advice of Fangrass. We've been up He said, honestly, I have no problems with my best group. And she said, for every hour I spend consulting on Fangrass, I spend 100 hours consulting on best group because it's so controversial. It's so hard to grow. It's um, so that that's writers that things can be pretty overwhelming. And she's somebody I'm going to go see my team. She, she's teaching a course on how do you convert your golf course to that grass when you come. Except it's going to be how do you do it in the states when they have many more permits, yeah. many more chemicals, yeah. that's yeah. the yeah. existing grass. I do is an interesting topic, right? Because one of the things that we struggle with in Canada is cement. So in this, say this is one square foot, in one square foot, our annual bluegrass will produce seven thousand seeds per year. The highest rate of bent grass is about 8,000 seeds per year. Any more than that, it's not going to work. So, any bluegrass is out competing with whatever we see, you know, double. So, this new scientific regular that's coming up, should call it new, it prevents seed production from the bluegrass. So, this will be the first time we've had this problem. That's such a really good point. Like, we will have a competitive advantage. And a lot of these plant with regulars, if you use them at a really high rate, will actually almost kill them in bluegrass. Like we saw a few years ago when our greens went low. Is what happened is I had this person working for me who really wanted to try using practice for the year in the year and see if we could stop greens from growing and reduce the amount of wear and tear on greens but still provide great green space. So we were spreading this practice for the year called the Primo right until October. We're normally we stop in September and it over regulated the greens. So the only way that, that this stuff is broken down in the plant is during the temperature. So as the grass gets warm and grows, it starts to metabolize this stuff like food, it burns it. Well, when it's cold temperature, it doesn't metabolize it. Then we come up into the and here's the thing, it doesn't metabolize it. Then here's the thing. And then there's a few fungicides that act like the plant growth regulator, and that could be the game. And basically, the greens just shut down. So we saw it in the drilling, we just could really find golf for every day that night. And in January, they, they turned yellow. February, they turned a little bit more yellow, and then they just shut down. They didn't grow again at that point. And we were out there with tarps. I think this is 2017. Kind of warm on the ground, it's going like the grass to grow. They could kill the grass, but you know, imagine the competitive advantage we would have had. We just would have found the dead grass in the biggest for that one. Mm -hmm. So that's what we could do with very good stuff. So we just shut them right down and talk with greater. They still look okay. They'd be kind of lying green. And then we just go to town on the bed grass. Mm -hmm. We have two point three four this covered in sand and sand cap. It's a great bed grass for everyone. You're right. Sure. And I'm just keeping the the polo. Oh, uh, I think ultimately our answer would be a blended bowl, right? You know, a 50 50 bowl. Because I think, you know, unless there's a wholesale change in how we need to develop, of course, I think members are going to struggle with getting off of a pure bed grass right away. Yeah. You know, like they look at Cradle Bay and they're probably 60 40, 60 percent, 40 percent bed grass. And they seem to kind of fit ebbs and flows. Like if you look at our 18th grade, there's probably 20 percent bed grass in that grade. So when the pool is suffering for a couple months a year, the bed grass kind of Grows out, and then the pool starts to grow, and the bent grass kind of recedes there. So there's this ebb and flow. And just like nature, whenever you've got more than one species, you're better off. And that's what we try to unpack. So we want the fescue and bent grass to try to create some diversity. The downside of fescue is it doesn't withstand any traffic. Right. And so where golf courses are successful with, with bent grass and fescue is they're getting 10, 12,000 rounds a year, 25 rounds a year. As soon as you get over that 20,000 round threshold, you can't manage a lot of these grasses, so you're going to have any bluegrass. Well, that's evident from the areas where we have fescue, yeah. where the members walk through. And it's bluegrass. dead. Yeah, I understand the bluegrass could be a little spot. Right? Well, I'm just, talking about, yeah. I'm just talking about the, the, the inability of fescue to, to stand dry. Yeah, you have to have a tea to green car pass if you're going to do fescue fairly. It's just beautiful. Yeah. But you're not talking to here. And then where it is. That goes to trumps. Oh, yeah, you, trumps, yeah. You, 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 yeah, it's like yeah. process. Well, I don't think the members I don't think the members care what grass is under their feet so long as it's big and thick pin their balls, it's up on it. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. That's what they want in the fairways. In the rough, you can explain that their ball goes down to the ground or it sits up or it's 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 the rough. It's un it's inconsistent, it's Possibly. unpredictable. But the fairways, they want the ball to sit up so they can get a nice hit at it. And that'll be a challenge with bank grass. Because the optimal height for bank grass is between one tenth of an inch, 100 thou, which is the thickness of a couple of credit cards, to as much as 250, depending on the subspecies, between a quarter inch. So long as we could maintain our fairways, maybe 
call it treating the thousands of years. But what are these patches of bent that are on number 11 and number 12 yeah. that were seeded by Alex exactly. 30 years yeah. ago? And they're lovely. Yeah. And they're all laying over them. They're all laying over, but they don't really get higher than a half inch. But they're but they're they thick and the ball sits up nicely. Yeah, the only downside is is if you let them go longer than than 20,0 get patchy puppy, and it just which is laid there, which isn't a bad thing, but it's it's going to feel a lot shorter than a half inch. So if you have a half inch and the bluegrass, which is a vertical growing grass, and then you have a half inch of bent grass, so by its very name, it's bent. So it's growing sideways. So what's the stolen at first grass that goes sideways across the ground? Mm -hmm. And as it goes back sideways, these are each are called stolens. These bones are there's a little leaf. Yeah, yeah. The majority of the time is growing that way. Mm -hmm. So so there's ways to get around it. You comb it all the time, you brush it with big big brushes, you drive them up there, you stand them up and mm -hmm. but yeah. Well, well if you do create on five bed grass, a bent bed grass fairway with very tight lies, similar to what we went through this past summer. Yeah. yeah. That would not go over well. No. no matter what it looks. No, that's what I'm trying to say. It doesn't matter what's under your feet, so long as your ball sits up nicely on it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, 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 what that's going to be a channel tree. But okay, so there's lots of bent grass fairways that golf us in the States. Yes. And so I can't imagine because I've been to golf up down there. They're not great. Well, but they have way less rounds. <laughs> but but they're also more difficult to play. Like if you play a bent grass golf course down the states and bent grass fairways, they're, they're harder to play out. They're not big to play golf course fairways. Well, they get to play that's a positive to have one or run. They're, they're slowly converting to bent grass. So they're not all bent grass now. What they did and the mistakes they made and they're trying to change is they were overseeing their fairways for decades with running wire grass. And then maybe 10, 12 years ago, disease emerged. I think because you've got a monoculture mm -hmm. called Great Leaf Spot. And it's kind of like, the aids of the grass with it just comes in and wipes up everything within 24 hours. There's no cure, no control. So these golf courses don't really have what they're going to do now. And they started spraying herbs that called segment or segue that selectively kills perennial wild grass to get rid of it. And they're interested in with that grass now. So it's going to be a 10 year conversion down there. And to Alice's point, they've got more herbicides that suppress and move that so that the bed grass can get an advantage. But like I said, I think that. Solution for us is a blend of both because I think that bank grass, you have to manage it in a very specific way. Very little water, very little fertilizer. You have to roll it, you have to mow it short, and that's not what you want. Maybe we'll get there eventually. Well, what are these patches on number 11 and number 12? Are they? Grass. They're older varieties of bank grass, too. Like, I was talking about they're a mix of, of oil and they're a mix of oil and bank. But you know, if you saw a big circular patch like that, 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 that big circular patch is. 80, 90 percent bent grass. There might be some any blue that's pointy, but it's an old bent grass called colonial bent grass. And it's the same bent grass that Queen Bay was seeded to. There's no colonial bed. It kind of ceased to exist in the city. And what's happened now in all grasses, and I'm sure in all different industries, is that they look at what's commercially successful and what people are looking at grass now is dark green, disease resistant, low no white cut, because these grasses are bred specifically for pipe services. So would you take that grass and put it on a drink? No, so there's no market for it. So nobody's doing any research on it. There's a few colonial events that we could get our hands on that we is doing research on, but they're not widely commercially available. They're also very, very cheap, which is great. But if you look at so what the gold standard used to use colonial bent from about 1920 to about 1960. The colonial bent used to cross pollinate and create all these weird little subspecies. So this guy named Joe Deutsch used to work at Penn State University. He went and he sampled all these grasses, took them back to his lab at Penn State, and created a whole bunch of new grasses. And the one that became a gold standard in the city was called Pencross, named after Penn State University. So it's a cross pollinization of a bunch of bent grasses. He found all around the world, spread them together. So they seeded them on golf courses like the Victoria Golf Club and Clear Bay because it was a gold standard. And then what they saw is after 20 years, they started to seg segment on green, and they saw really deep green varieties and really dense varieties. So you know, they kept that seed. We went to go back to lab and rebred those and created G2, G6, and A4, and A2. Then they made the chemical standard. And then it's it's sort of like cigarettes, right? Where they do the research and where they spend the money is the one that becomes popular, and that's the one that's pushed. Maybe a drug is a good example. They spend millions doing this research. They're not going to promote the one from 1960 that they don't have any potential to sell. They're going to sell this one that they spent all the money to research on. 
So again, we can use that to our advantage. As long as we can get the seed supply, we're going to be better off using colonial. The downside of colonial is a little more disease susceptible. So the ones that are breeding now are more hellish bot resistant. So we're going to switch from being any bluegrass susceptible to a dracmus and that can catch to a colonial that is susceptible to hellish bot. Now, hellish bot can be controlled by increasing nitrogen and by rolling your growth to the new off. And you can spray it on the sideline as well, but it's like one or two instead of the fall. So again, bent grass is kind of less for the Does that make sense? There's a lot done that. It's a lot done that. Yeah. The yeah. seed is very complicated. The grass is complicated. Yeah. The thing is that those patches on number 11 and number 12 are really nice to play out of. And even in even in the the, the bad days, if you want to call them yeah. last summer when when uh, we uh, had that experiment going. Those patches were there, and if your ball was in it, you were the lucky one in your four ball. So here's the question. Um, so as bad as the conditions were, June, July, and August, would you individually spend $200,000 more to fix those three months? Because we'd all, we'd all agree that by September, October, those problems are gone. Would we all agree? That by September, October, yeah, yeah. That's so it. for June, July, August, is that worth two hundred thousand dollars? Because that, that's what we say. That's my reaction is no, it isn't. And take it when June, July, and August were the driest in mm -hmm. record you ever had. And I mean, I, I think back like where I grew up. You know, if you didn't get any water from the grass, it, it, it dried up. It, it dried up. Yeah, yeah you, had water, water. Right, you had water on your greens. Yeah, and it wasn't like it was on the cover. Like, yeah. It wasn't like it created catastrophic cracks in the fairway that we would never have to cover. It just, you wait a month, it cools off and it comes back. And that's, that's the beauty of where sustainable golf is going. But a lot of super tests lose their job during that sustainability of that transition. Well, and, and, and that's, what, that's what we were trying to achieve with different mm -hmm. life conditions. But the members didn't, didn't like it. Didn't no. want it. Yeah, it's kind of like weren't prepared to put up with it. But you know, they might they might I mean, say, okay, you want to pay this much more, mm -hmm. or you want to do this for once every hundred years when you have it just dry. Mm -hmm. you know, I, mean, well, I, I think we weren't we maybe weren't spending as putting as much water on because the budget hadn't been approved. Well, it wasn't even that. We just well because we were keep, we kept getting feedback week by week by week that you know if we did have a, a rain day or a day where we built more water, we could complain. Almost immediately, like, of course, it's too wet. I hit a wet spot on this river. Like, I had one individual on a Thursday in July say, I played last night and I got some mud on my ball in the 7th fairway. Shut the irrigation off. You know, I got a couple of four else emails ready. So we shut the irrigation off. And so on a fifth quarter year, we spent 100,000 in water. This year, we spent 70,000 in water. Like, I mean, that's unbelievable. That's that's almost unheard of. And uh, I mean, the other thing is that you didn't have enough people to go out and have water. Yeah, yeah, or or more. Yeah, yeah. Or less. So, so yeah, you know, again, like I said in the article, it was the perfect year to try something. It didn't work. And again, I'd argue it only didn't work for 30% of the members because 30% hated it, 30% loved it. And I would say the other 60% didn't respond because you look at the numbers, there's only 275 people responding. And if you look at the cross section of the survey, it, even in the ones that I highlighted in the bed during that meeting, it was 50 50. Yeah, 50% of the response. Yeah. Of course, it was great. I like this move towards sustainability and less kinds of stuff. 50% said, This is the worst ever. Oh, which is a miracle. And yeah. then, see, yeah, I'm a member of six golf clubs, and this is the worst one ever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so, and, you know, personally, I had people come up to me and say, I think it's ridiculous that they're getting all upset about how yeah. these conditions are. You know, have they ever played in Scotland? That's what it's like. Mm -hmm. And everyone dreams about going to Scotland. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, we, we can't just listen to the loudest voice, you know. And that, that's where Ben Crest would give you a bit of a buffer because some of those years decide to push it, it's going to be there back to them. And the other part of that equation is lots and lots and lots of progress. And what is the first thing that gets cut in the budget every year? You know, we're talking about closing the golf course you know, every day for three weeks of duration. Well, that's something you don't have to do if you just slot it on the sand. But, but again, like you're training an operation expense for material for a labor expense, right? Because labor doesn't even matter. Like it's like you have the answer that there's 15 people on staff anyway, most of the area. So let's just cut the top of the program. Right? Well, but I mean, next year, yeah. I'm not cutting the top of the program. Like we need to be paying 200,000 million fairways on sand 
And then they won't know this from the older energy. They won't know this from the office of the It's just going to be that much more consistent. Yeah. But the problem will be that you'll put top dressing in one time at a time. And then you'll be trying to, to, to do a proper job of top dressing with how to sand. I just won't do it. And that won't, and that won't work. No, but that's what I did this year is that I, I try to do a top dressing to cut it in half and secure and go through the ball. Yeah. Like spend zero is better than spending. Yeah. No, no you, you doing it at all. Can you hear us? I can't hear you though. How about now? Yes. That's better. Perfect. Hello, hey. everyone. Hi. Uh, so maybe we can just go around the room there and introduce everybody, starting with Michael. Yeah. Uh, Tim is just about to join us here, too. So maybe we'll hold off for that, if that works for you. Oh, there's another person. Hi, Tim. You're muted, Tim. Yeah, he's muted. If he's talking, it's kind of hard to tell. It's dark. Very bright behind. Yeah. Do I look long and skinny? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It looks long and skinny on my screen. Yeah. Seems stretched. Hey. Well, <clears throat> hey, my loves. My name is Aaron Yeomans Rutledge. I'm a biologist. I've been working on this project uh, with Paul for couple of years now uh, doing the original habitat assessment and working through permitting with DFO and other agencies. Yeah, I'm Tim. Uh, I manage the engineering portion of our company. So we do a lot of design build <clears throat> for in-water projects, wastewater, um, industrial facilities, and a lot of shoreline projects. So. <clears throat> Awesome. I'm Paul, obviously. Um, you know me, I know you. My right is Wayne. Hi, I'm uh, the current men's captain and um, very pleased to have you. What was going on? What all's happening? Thank you. Yeah, Tom Warren from uh, just a member here at the BGC. I'm Allison Murdoch. I'm the chair of the Lakes Committee for this year. I'm Mike Parker. Um, I'm just a head health professional here for many years. Uh, now retired. Uh, okay. I, my understanding, Paul, you would just like to give us an up or for us to give you an update on where things are at uh, with the project uh, associated with permitting, um, remaining steps there, remaining agencies to work through, and then kind of next steps into construction and support in that construction with uh, Weaver Tech and yourselves. Yes, please. And as I mentioned before, I find the whole uh, quotation proposal very confusing. So I apologize for, for always asking for updates. That is not a problem. We, it's quite convoluted processes of permitting through different agencies and different components. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a maze out there for getting projects done, especially these days. A lot of First Nations consultations and multiple agencies having their own little separate requirements here. So, so a little recap is we completed a habitat or completed a preliminary design, uh, did a habitat assessment and went through permitting through DFO um, and Crown Lands. And we got pushed back from that, uh, some initial design where Crown Lands was the main uh, hurdle in that situation where they are no longer permitting hard riprap shorelines. That's technically, it's not that they're not doing it, but there's a four to five year wait period. And it's kind of with intent that they're establishing this long wait period to try to push people away from these hard revetments. So think of seawalls, riprap, and into these more nature based shoreline protection mechanisms that they're. Uh, trying to get everybody on board with. So that's nature based is using kind of softer, smaller substrates, using vegetation to anchor that into foreshore areas. So it has a higher habitat value for both marine and terrestrial habitats. Uh, what do we spend to date on all that? We, with Weaver Tech, uh, we have a budget of 85 and to date we're at 81 of that. 
That also included uh, the coastal engineering initial assessment we had by uh, Otavio Seo, uh, who is a coastal engineer out of Vancouver, uh, who did the initial assessment. That was again provided to TFO. Uh, that they were really happy with that design or that assessment components. Uh, however, because it didn't meet this nature based or soft shoreline system, we looked at trying to navigate getting around this. Uh, that's when we approached Northwest Hydraulic Consultants, NHC, who is a coastal engineer in designing these things rather than just the assessment portion, which the last person was. Our initial person was uh, to do this nature based design. So that's uh, where we uh, brought in NHC. Uh, things kind of where do we get? We, NHC did a preliminary design, which I can present here to you. I don't know if. Paul, I know you're familiar with it, but I'll just pop it up on the screen. Uh, Paul, can you allow me to share my screen, please? Does that work? Let's try it again. There we go. Thank you. You want to sell so this is the preliminary design of the nature-based uh, design here by NHC. Um, it's kind of gone for more sandy shoreline, more vegetation. And if you can see my cursor at all in here. Uh, yeah. There's kind of three beaches. You guys are probably very familiar with the site. So there's kind of three beaches for five, uh, teeing off these locations. That first beach that gets skinny and pushes into the course, that was one of the main concerns of trying to shore up that shoreline so we don't see any more erosion along that section. Uh, and then also provide some shoreline stabilization in this second long stretch here. Uh, and you get up to this steep bank, you see some erosion going on there before you get up into the rock uh, wall here. Uh, this is kind of a detailed drawing so for this beach one, where to get around being pinched in here and having to kind of give up some of this cart path, we look at building a kind of a timber frame cart path over top of the riprap revetment that would be in the section. And then over to our right here would be kind of a sandy vegetated uh, sand dune kind of habitat to kind of flow into the design of the uh, course, kind of enhance what's currently there along the vegetation, kind of make this dune habitat, which is kind of flowy, it's quite pretty. Again, over here on the second beach, uh, just more of that dune kind of habitat. Uh, and then off to your third beach here where we'd have vegetation up top, a bit of rock wall that you wouldn't really see uh, while playing, it would just be all facing into the sea, and then uh, some beach enhancements down at the bottom to support that nature-based approach. Uh, here you can see in beach one where you would have a little cart path over top of almost kind of hiding some of the rock that would be there placed strategically uh, with a geo membrane back to support the upland area and then a bit more vegetation in there without compromising or loss of uh, any more of the upland of course. Of this Pardon is me? That's a bay. bay. That's the okay. first bay. So we we take advantage of having this nice kind of bridge and kind of stout timber frame thing that you could drive over and walk over. Kind of a nice viewing platform looking up. We give you a bit of elevation there too uh, and kind of tie into that. So. That was one of the new additions there as well to kind of compensate for having our original design of a cart path uh, coming upland of where the revet was. It makes sense. Maybe we just pause there for a second. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think this is the most controversial part of the project. Yes. If you if you imagine 
right now, this is where your car path is. Yeah. And Department of Fisheries Motions won't allow you to fill any of this in. So that if by the time you create this natural habitat that you they request, your car path is going to be almost parallel with the bunker on the left side bunker on the full green. If you go back, Aaron, to the original picture there, this one, back to one of the first slides. So this whole thing would get pushed back to here. So if you want to keep it in this general vicinity, portion of it has to be on pilings kind of suspended over top of rocks. So it's going to have a boardwalk like look to it mm -hmm. that goes from here to five. The challenge is where do you get cars in and out from four? So the way it's drawn right now is the cars would be coming in here, play five, go back up the path and all the way to that five. But if you don't do it this way, the next piece of stable land is here. So your car path is going to be there. And that cuts into the fourth barrel. That's in the fourth yeah. Yeah. This is This is avoiding cutting into the fourth fairway. And there's a really great example of it in the city where I walked on water from. I took some pictures of it and I'll send it out. Which we'll look at that real quick. Do you know or do you have a way of determining uh, where there is bedrock along that area? No, we'd have to do some test pits, but likely we wouldn't do that. We'd just put blocks or foundations and then just have a concrete column that would be hidden and cased with the uh, rock uh, revetment protection area. And then on the back side here, that would all be covered in. So you wouldn't really see much of it. You just have enough height to allow big high waves to come in and kind of come over and crest into the dune again, kind of already as it does now without causing damage to kind of the vegetation or to the walkway there. Yeah, make me get more sense like during construction that we would either bury sonar tubes <clears throat> uh, or lock blocks like while we're building the riprap. And then that way the timber, the carpenters when they come along, everything's already ready for them and they just, you know, and the lock blocks might be flush with the rocks. They don't just stick up or anything, you know, they can build up from them basically. <clears throat> Is basically a concrete support structure underneath this thing. And, uh, yeah, they'd be like mini footings. Like you have, um, you either bury half blocks or sonar tubes. Like sonar tubes you see on the bottom of someone's deck, they're like a cylinder, you know, cylinder of cardboard. It's all concrete and that's buried down. Yeah, it kind of like mimic a very nice big timber frame deck or walkway there. Have we explored the possibility of some kind of a bridge from the forward T across the bay to the, to the yeah. airway? Mm -hmm. From the forward T? Where the forward T is the city. Well, well that, 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 we want to add side down to the other shore. Yeah, the yeah. 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 Something like that. Because you've got to have. It either be a steel structure, it would have to be, the, and, and that's a pretty big band. That would be a big, and it's going to be a good approval again. You guys, you could probably say more than I can, but you'd be in the in the requirement for a portion of permit to build a structure across the bay, right? Yeah. You know, thinking from the white to the green tube? Yeah, from the yeah. You're looking into crown line water lot leases because you're going past your high water mark and property line, mm -hmm. uh, the engineering cost and the Construction costs of a full bridge would be quite high in comparison to this so option. Here. Like that I, yeah, or, or yeah. other, other question here is: Has this been tested by DFO at all? Have you run this by them and said, "Hey, you know, here's just some stuff we're working on. How likely are you going to approve this?" Or Kyle Morris, have you done either? No, we've been waiting for that final stage and approvals to uh, submit these updated drawings and updated habitat assessment based on. These design changes. So, whose approval are you waiting on? Uh, the clubs. What other choice do we have? Uh, we don't. We, we were just a bit on hold last year. So, uh, again, we're waiting for this to go ahead. Uh, as long as there's no cost, there, is there a cost associated to it? There, there is. There's about, uh, I think it costed out at three to five grand to do the update into the habitat assessment and initial engagement with DFO. So this is the minor portion of the cost estimate there. Uh, but then this was also tie into the new permitting process for nature-based with 
Crown lands, uh, as well as some permitting of foreshore areas within the District of Oak Bay. So there's basically three sets of agencies to go through, uh, plus engagement with Songhees. So just to be clear, $5,000 just to get what we've done to date, kind of rubber staff or fully approved? Uh, that would be updating our effects assessment uh, and the DFO application and submitting that and initial engagement with them. Uh, if they have any other questions, uh, they after our first report, they did come back with additional comments that needed to be addressed. Uh, and that was all included in the original budget there. It's often sure. there's some back and forth. And now would be a good time just to go through line by line what's left to do. Sorry, what was that, Paul? Now would be a good time to go through your budget of what's left to do and what the costs are starting at that phase. So like let's Absolutely. call it phase one. Yes. Uh, so we provided an update budget uh, mid-November uh, that included uh, recent, recent doing our management plans effects assessment using NHC's design. Uh, and submitting that to DFO for review. Uh, and then was developing the development permit under the District of Oak Bay and going through the process of the nature based shorelines protections uh, requirements and submissions to Crown Lands, uh, along with uh, initial engagement with Songhees Nation uh, as part of the consultation process that would be required through DFO and through Crown Lands. Uh, and all that is 5,000? No, that was broken down to that. All totaled up was 17 for 18,000 with some contingencies uh, for engagement with DFO, Crown Lands, uh, and the district of an additional 10. Now, is this inclusive of the five grand that you just said? Yes, it does. As so that, well as that's... initial engagement with uh, Songhees. There. So typically take all our, create an information package, outline what we're going to do, present that to uh, whatever nations are in the area, in this case Songhees, uh, and get some initial back and forth. Usually we receive comments, they'll ask for a site visit often, uh, and that was the cost included in that. So that would be the additional $10,000. So say they want to do site visit, want to get it pre present to them. Um, items as such so then is there a phase two uh then we're getting into tenders construction um part of nhc had some final design components and then also construction support uh that was around 18 to twenty thousand dollars uh we have outlined here uh some costs for developing a tender package on tim's side and ours uh, and then support through construction management, uh, construction, and then any environmental monitoring that would be required by DFO. Items like as you're doing works, uh, sediment yeah. control, pardon? We can't read any of that. So as soon as uh, you go to do Yeah, if I can make that any bigger, can you read that now? Yeah. Start at the top. Yeah, absolutely. Again, the permitting side of things was about seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars with about ten thousand contingencies because we really just don't know who's going to review this, what kind of pushback. We all can get quite a wide array of people and their ideologies of how environmental work should be done. So it's a bit of a perspective. Some people are more level headed, some people are a bit off and left field. Uh, it's unfortunately a bit of a luck of the draw. Uh, so that's why can't be 100% certain. Could be a couple questions. It could be a big list of things. But based on where we're at now, uh, I don't really anticipate that. But I always like to have that contingency and clients aware of the, those potential needs. Uh, again, to recap, we have Department of Fisheries Oceans updating the effects assessment and resubmitting that and initial engagement the Crown Lands new application for nature-based projects that we've changed the design to, the District of Oak Bay's uh, development permits for sensitive habitats, in this case, anywhere within 30 meters of a 
marine or aquatic habitat, rivers, lakes, wetlands. Uh, again, we have this beautiful ocean front here that we're dealing with. Uh, and again, engagement with uh, some of these First Nations, providing a package for them to review the project. Uh, we're finding the province is so bogged down uh, for them to even have a First Nations engagement agent is a three to six month process. So they are encouraging proponents to do the initial engagement themselves, document all that engagement and hand that over, basically doing the province's job for them. Like most of this stuff here is going on. Uh, so as you get, get into the NH, so the tender package? Uh, and it, yes, so it's a kind of combination of the tender package, uh, construction support and procurement, uh, where NHC need to complete final design drawings. I think I can skip down to their cost estimate here. So it was line items four and five are left to complete. They had a budget of uh, around 13,000. That's probably increased since the initial budget. So we rounded that up to about 20. However, part of that can be shared by Weaver Technical for the construction support. Uh, and we talked with the NHC team and they're happy to share, share those costs, whether they come do some site visits, we do site visits, uh, as long as somebody's there to supervise from environmental construction capacity, they're happy to pursue in some kind of co-relationship there. This is where I always get hung up here. And if you go back to the, okay, so right, right there. So seventeen thousand for the tender, twenty thousand dollars for final design and construction support, and mm -hmm. then down there drop ten percent of project cost for construction management. That's different than construction support. Yeah, so that's like a, if, like for instance, Paul decides doesn't want to be involved in the project and you know we provide a superintendent or something <clears throat> so someone who manages the project but that's kind of an optional thing it's not so you know, if you're managing the project if you're out there every day managing the project then you know then none of this is really neat. <clears throat> so so that could save this as much as 150,000 sorry could save us as much as 150,000 Tim yeah, yeah, exactly. If you're out there or someone's out there that you, it's on your payroll, then that's a soft cost, not a hard cost, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you. That makes total sense. And then environmental monitoring, monitoring is next. Yeah, so we typically do a day rate uh, for personnel, quite flexible with uh, our staff. Uh, also, if NHC is out there and can take photos or if you can take photos during the day, we can use those instead of having staff on site every day. Um, but our typical standard day rate is about thousand to twelve hundred dollars, um, just at an average of eleven a day. That includes any sampling equipment um, and cost for the person being down there for a full day rate. Uh, usually gonna find it quite flexible. We will record everybody's hours and just charge those. Uh, and if it's under that eleven hundred a day, we just charge whatever the person's worked. Um, but we find it's often easier just to provide a day rate because of flexibility that provides uh, the construction team to work on. Okay, do you, do you know roughly what you think it would take to complete this project? Uh, including construction costs or just for permitting and support from here? Sorry, the time, like how long duration? In, until we get approvals, until we do the work, um, I can break that down for approvals. Depending on, I'd say six months to a year for approvals. Uh, with Crown lands, it's a bit unknown because it's a new process there. And to be honest, I haven't worked with Oak Bay before. We do a lot of other municipalities with CVRD uh, and CRD. Uh, they're fairly good, but uh, if there is some hiccups and if they lose staff and stuff like that, it's it's really hard for us to gauge, but I'd say six months to 12, 18 at the worst uh, when we're looking cool. to start construction. So I if, think, we, if we give you the go ahead in April, 
what would the timeline look like? Uh, yeah, I'd say six months at the best. Uh, somewhere between six months and twelve months would be my my think, feeling on this. I think we'd file the applications, assuming we like telling the regulators we want to start in the spring of twenty twenty four. So there's well, that's what we say our start date is. <clears throat> Whether or not we actually get approved by then, you know, if they're slow or whatever, or they have staff changeovers, that stuff kind of happens sometimes. Um, but either way, we'll just tell them, you know, we'd like to start in the spring of 2024. So we could safely assume that if we had approval for the membership at the end of April, that by the end of December, we would have approval from all the interested parties. What's the ideal construction in the building? Like how long would the construction take? Okay. Uh, when 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 can we get permits to do the work because of the habitat and how long would it take? Yeah, so we're gonna ask for if we got if we started in April with submissions, we would ask all the regulators that we're dealing with for a construction start of the next spring. <clears throat> so whether or not we actually get them or they get around with the permit applications, it's not really like much we can do about it. <clears throat> But I thought, I thought in the ideal habitat. world, you'd be, what's that? I thought there was habitat restrictions that had to happen before February. Uh, some of them do, but these little municipality, you know, they don't have any, they just play their own, they have their own rules. So, um, I guess I guess from our perspective, Tim, I don't think we'd want to do the project in April. Like anything later than April, you're getting in the prime golf season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, whatever, mm -hmm season you'd like to do, but I'm just thinking realistically, if we're looking at like an, a year for approvals, we could ask them for approvals earlier than that. It's just might not be pragmatic in terms of requests, but then we just ask. What would so be the ideal, what's the ideal time for the club for these February, works to occur in? February, 2024. February? Yeah, that's reasonable. Uh, I don't think there would be any strict environmental issues on that there is fisheries windows but because majority of the works are happening upland and you're just providing clean fill and vegetation on there the risk is lower as opposed to the initial design where it would have been more strict and then there's also monitoring and mitigation measures we can establish to allow works to occur basically whenever uh it is suitable to the club uh there would be a bit of fighting with some tides but february is pretty good for that Does that trigger any questions from you? Yeah, I think I I think the if if the club if the club membership approves the project at the annual general meeting sometime in April, then that is when your six to twelve month permit dating sort of time frame and hopefully get the permits. That that's when that would start. Yes. Yeah. So if it's six, so if it's six months or somewhere shortly after that, then we could be thinking about doing work in February 2024. If it's 12 months, then we're not thinking about working until possibly November, December of 2024. Is that an option, guys? Like, can you get permission to do this work in November, October, or does it have to be because? Okay, anytime we've talked about this, Tim, it's always been kind of January, February is the combination of low tides at night and mm -hmm. trees protection. And am I way off here? Yeah, somewhere. yeah, like tides are definitely a factor, but you can you could probably find a contractor that would work at night if needed. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's it's not going to be like a huge crew per se. That's you know, what we did last time. We did it all at night. Yeah. Yeah. From there's so you, got, you got night low tides, December, January. Mm -hmm. Even right now, like I just I looked out this morning and it was a pretty low tide. When I woke up. Yeah. Should yeah. should we be shooting them for November 2024? Yeah, yeah. Assuming we've missed the February, you know, we we say we asked for February 23, <clears throat> or sorry, 24. 
Am I doing the math? Yeah, yeah. So yeah no, if we don't make the February cut, uh, we can easily defer it until the fall of 2024. No, I think what Paul is asking is maybe we asked for the earlier, this, this coming November. <clears throat> Is that correct? Or are you saying 2024? I think Allison and Mike have a question first. That might oh. change my answer. To... Well, my question is Is there any chance that either DFO or OPE or the First Nations just say absolutely not? No. Yes. I think with this nature based, it's very is, low. Is there a reasonable risk. chance of that happening? Or what are the. I think it's really low risk. By going to this nature based, you're almost being one of the four runners of this new kind of protection based system. And you can almost advertise it, showcase it as you're doing this big habitat enhancement. You're following these new regulations that are encouraging people to uh, use this more habitat conscious and not having a kind of a, a wall front on the area. So I see so very little these, risk. A bit of the sales pitch to these people that, that have the power or authority to say yay or nay. Is, is yes, it is a bit. It, it is almost is a showcase. And you can, who does that? Pardon me, I didn't catch that last bit. Who does that? Who would make the presentation to these entities? Uh, it goes in our studies to them, so they see the drawings, and then they're more looking at the technical aspects. Okay, what impacts are there? Right. And then on First Nations side, there's a, usually a con condensed package that's given to them that summarizes it, and then if they want to see the actual studies, we provide those. Um, <clears throat> so it like kind of summarizes the project from a high level with some drawings, but then more information is available if they ask for it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you go back to what I was going to say, would we be better to get our plans in in April once this is all approved by the membership and shoot for February, but then have a backup plan of November 2024? Because yes. the reason I ask is that if we go through the process again of getting members to approve this, getting members to approve the dollar amounts, and we don't do it within a reasonable amount of time. We have to keep going back to membership for approval, which just delays us another year. Mm -hmm. So at some point we have to pick a reasonable target and say, hey, it's, it's November, 2024, and here's the budget. Mm -hmm. And so if you think it's going to be difficult at all to get senders and quotes, or if there's going to be any delay in the approval process, I think we should just shoot for November, 2024. The only reason I've never suggested it in the future or in the past was my misunderstanding that we were only allowed to do the work in January, February because of fisheries. There was some, yeah, that you're right on that. Because of the last design, there was more push to go out and then compensate for some of the lost beachfront habitat that DFO was concerned about. So there was more restrictions on us with bringing the everything back up and using these nature-based and smaller uh, rock sizes, sands, gravels, and, and vegetation, then there's less of a concern on that. Really, there isn't much at all. Yeah, so those restrictions don't really apply when you're mostly out of the water. Mm -hmm. That's great. Do they address the, the expense of, you know, if it's just gonna last 10 years and then, you know, you're, you're another, Say fifty thousand to replace what we got washed away over the ten year period. Have, have you guys done that, or do you guys do that? Um, look at the long term, not the long term. Say the ten year life, twenty year life of this installation, and what it's going to cost to repair every ten years, every twenty years, just so we can do a capital budget. That is more of an NHE coastal engineer to speak to that. Uh, however, because this is a mixed, it's not just a full nature based, you are getting those hard riprap revetments in place uh, that will protect that beach one area. I'll show you that. Yeah, they can make, uh, you may have like landscape maintenance. <clears throat> For sure, like if you had a huge storm that washed away a bunch of sand and plants or something, there'll be some landscape maintenance. But, you know, the riprap itself is like <clears throat> weighs more than a Volkswagen, you know, like it's really heavy. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to budge 
Do you, um, you, guys, do you guys think that we'd actually get some accretion over time instead of erosion? There's little going on in that area. Uh, there's not a lot of movement. There's all those rock outcroppings. We looked at part of the uh, coastal engineering assessment. Uh, so there's not really that much going on. There's a lot of shifting that does happen in that middle bay. Uh, so you, you, you'll see more in that area and then some losses in these other two, beach one and beach three over here, um, where stuff does get eroded off here, uh, but it does stay within the whole little bay. Basically. It's protected from all these little rock islets. Yeah. And you probably have noticed over time how this big long beach kind of shifts and moves around. Yeah. Do you know approximately how much property we lose in this design on the third bay? There wasn't much. Oh, in the third bay? Uh, trying to see if we can zoom in here. Is see there what... a red line of the existing contour? Yes, that is. I'm, I'm just trying to get so that over there for you. Is to, is to build a riveted wall has to have a certain angle of repose. Right. So that's the dilemma of these four short things is that you have to do that angle onto your land. So as they so like, uh, cut some dirt, might lose like five to ten yards depending on which yeah. side on there. <clears throat> so there's, so there's not that, much along the top, and again, we can bury it as well. Yeah. So the next area is still there. It's just yeah. smoke steeper. From the red line, that's exposed rock. Yes, and then the brown on top of that is, is a fill uh, where you can revegetate over top of that as well. So it, it's basically, it's following the same thing as you're removing material and then just placing different material in that place. So there, there really isn't so much loss. Zoom in more, you can see the edge of the rough, the fairway there, <clears throat> right, right, kind of where the brown is, where the brown layer starts, you can see it. So you're not really losing much because all that ground right there is all rough. It's got rocks. And... Mm -hmm. So it's basically yeah. like oh, taking that. Oh, I just thought I mentioned so it doesn't come as a surprise, right? It's yeah, I mean, you could go in much further yeah. there. You could go in another, I don't know, 10 yards. No advantage, so you give up land, right? No. no. Yeah. I'll go to the but side view on this one. Fact, it becomes a bit more of a light up hole. And yeah. We're going to need to find ways to. Take the driver out of the hands of the long headers. Basically, I think I would keep that as an ace in your back pocket in case you ever decide to need to green light, but mm -hmm. like, because then you need less of a cut in. Yeah. Because uh, you know, and then again, I'm not going back to the spur roof plan, but if you ever wanted to space six B and four, that means maybe five green slightly right. The more five green comes slightly right, the more that bay comes into play, and you create that. It would be nice point. to bring that bay into play. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That bay. Right. So, so we have the design. Sorry for interrupting. We have the design drawing saying it's two and a half to four meters change, and it would just be on a different slope here. So if you see the brown line coming along here, that's existing, and then it would regrade to a lower slope, vegetate it. Uh, so from existing area, it's about two and a half to four meters back. Okay. Okay. Uh, there you go. Less than I. That was a lot more tired. This is this is the, 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 this is the, the way, and this is. Oh, are we still in bay three? This yeah. this is up by that lone pine tree. Yeah, yeah, bay three. three. Yeah. Fair enough. So yeah, again, one planning consideration is whether we want to blast on site for their rip wrap or import material. If we import, most likely it's going to be some very very different color, gray or you know, unless we're really selective on. Rip up when you buy. So we've talked about blasting the knoll and behind the um, green as one option or across the street, but then we're just bringing rock over the fairway anyway. So it <clears throat> might make more sense to, I think Paul, you've talked about moving the green up the fairway a little bit and then using that current location. I don't think there's gonna be any appetite for that. So if you, if you zoom out while you guys are there now, so if this is for green, I drew what it would look like to actually move the screen back into this area. 
because this area is all bedrock and you could blast that and move yeah. as bedrock or you could potentially blast this out but this is where that that very rare plant is that before it's all over and i don't yeah. think you're going to be able to do any work in that yeah we reviewed the areas and it's right down by the water and it's that vetch that needs to get spray from the ocean so it lives in this kind of high salinity environment uh so there is opportunity further up but it would might just take some more navigating uh so if, you, if you go if you go further up to kind of the mid-center of that rock outcropping that's about where i saw the toys all over with um i try to think of the biologist matt fairborn yeah I, so yeah like I figured, right behind the green to the right there's a lot of gorse in there and there wasn't really any diversity oh yeah yeah that's true you can leave the block behind the fifth green and clear all that out between five and ten yeah yeah, and you can actually technically make the hole longer because you can <laughs> blast the uh, whole mountain behind it. Take that out. Well, not the whole mountain. You'll, it will pull out, I think, a thousand cubic meters or something. I can't remember. Yeah, well, that rock wall used to be hidden by the way. Dave Wall actually cracked that. Yeah. How many cubic meters of rock do you need? I thought it was a thousand, but that's, I haven't thought about it in a long time. So we, yeah, we talked to them. We talked about taking it from up in this area or from across the area. There's a lump of rock in yeah, here that rock, some potential interest of removing your say. We probably can blast the whole back of the lemon and take all that rock out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How much difference in cost is it to buy rock and have it transported? Rock can cost like uh for that size, it's probably gonna be like 15 bucks a ton or something. Whereas blasting is like between four and seven dollars a ton, I think. So, but you know, you add trucking to that tip or that purchase too, right? So you got twenty dollars a ton or more to buy it. Farther away, yeah, you're better off with it. Yeah, and the thing is, like the size of rocks he's talking about, you can bring three. Yeah, you need to. Can't put it in any kind of truck. You gotta. Be really careful as not to smash the truck when you're loading it. <laughs> yeah. Whereas if you blast on site, you have like you can, from here rock. all the way to there, all that out. But up there is where those uh, no, rare plants are. Right here. So when I, whenever I've walked there with Matt, it kind of goes, there's a vein that goes from here through this crack where water tends to be through here and all the way down there. You can, we could ask for a I mean, we probably should do that, guys, is get a biologist to come up and actually help us identify the areas of concern and just map them off, just get them off and then do the blasting calculation once we take that off. And you not know, transplant this all over? No. No, the critical habitat that's been identified is all along the water's edge and down here. It, this area is outside of what's being mapped for critical habitat. Again, it really needs that salinity input spray yeah, so, so uh, they've actually, if they've seen the species though it's a different story so you just have to yeah you could, you, could, you could change your long-term plan for number 10 like 10 could be more of a dog way if you took the rock over between 10 and 5 you could change potential position of 5 green a little bit right i wouldn't go too far forward because it just creates a lot back to 6 green or 6 green but it kind of from where his mouse pointer is over, it creates a lot of different options. And again, and, you know, what we what we don't know what we found last time we did this guy is that about the first 25 feet just turned to dust when we blasted it. It wasn't until we got 50 to 75 feet down on the ground when we actually got decent rock. Oh. Because it's so weathered. So we have to plant that, which makes great fill, right? So when all that blasted crap that comes off the top, we would just put that back in the hole. Yeah, it's really expensive. Like, I would think we need a hundred to hundred fifty thousand dollars contingency for this. Yeah, because just for the rock, just for the rock, because we're going to blast all it out. And we should basically take the full part of it, take it all out, and haul it back in there and fill it because you're going to have a 75 foot hole behind five green that goes all the way to 10. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the difficult thing to do on the Saturday. How many, like, a thousand cubic yards? That sort of 
volume was used on the seventh wall. Would that be like a thousand? I think it was, I think I want to say 1500 or 1200, right? Because a thousand cubic yards is a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I'm just, I pulled that number out of my rear end. I don't remember what that <laughs> Well, it impressed me, Tim. If you look at the if you look at the wall on number seven, and you look at the areas that we're considering doing with big rock, because yes. not all of it is done with big rock. Mm -hmm. The the areas that we're doing with big rock, I, I can't see how that thousand cubic meters is so like I don't see how it compares. Well, I mean, one of the challenges on, on seven is we started, I think, with 1,250 cubic meters with the design, but we quickly ran out of rock. That design was actually just a bit further out the seven fairway. So, I mean, I, I think we probably used 1,000 cubic meters and we just called it that because we couldn't generate more rock. Right. We ran out. But that's 150 yards long, roughly. Yeah. yeah. And so from the and, and, and much yeah. higher than the third bay. Yeah. That 1,000 cubic meters. That might have, might have been all the bill. But going going back to, to Aaron and Tim, there is that that this bay has rock underneath. So you can play yeah. blast rock in all three bays. Yeah, how much rock is in bay two, guys? Because you do have some armor stone underneath the soft shore, right? Yes, we do. It's a smaller size material. It's graded differently. But let me pull back up that. Uh, so it's not the same kind of rock as we had on the smaller one. Smaller, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I understood that the whole any any of the rock was much smaller rock. Except for Bay 3, because Bay 3 is where it's going to be in the cars. And they're probably going to be a road. Like, again, I'm not designing or building it, but there, there'd be some large rocks in there to create keystones. So you put them there behind it because you don't want them to move. Right. right. No, I mean, you, you, could, you guys probably see that that in two dimensions on paper looks great, and you draw uniform rock sizes and all that. But really, the artistry is the excavator operator keying big rocks and small rocks in to make this work, right? So there's 150 just on the beach number two and three line. There's about 150 meters lineal length, and it's 0.8. Five meters thick, something. And how wide is that? How wide is that ripper up there? And it's like uh, ten meters. It ranges from ten to four, kind of thing. Yeah, it's very long. Switch back to the other. Could you guys? Could you guys just give us those numbers on a spreadsheet at some point? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. It's yeah, just, okay. It's not yeah, the last detailed design phase. Is, gotcha. I'm just rough. Spitballing it or not. Okay, so that's two to one. So when, so when you're going to do in Boston calculations, when you do length times width times depth, what bulking factor do you use for rock? Uh, oh, you mean like to calculate a volume? Like this? Yeah. Yeah, it depends on the rock. Some rock is a lot fluffier once it's blown up <clears throat> and others. So. Uh, and just but, to show you, here's the uh, critical habitat that's been mapped previously. Okay. So the area we'd be looking at is up here outside of that. Usually, like a seven inch or eighteen inch minus to something like two point five tons per cubic meter. So, sorry, Tim. The question was. How do you get the rock from the blasting site down to where we're actually going to use it? And I was just whispering million dollar rock truck. Yeah, the, the big trucks, I quite understand because the, the, the rocks are heavy and they're That's dark and all that. So, I, I totally get that. But I'm talking to, the, I mean, you, you blasted some rock and you have these three nice pieces that you want to use. And so you put these three nice pieces into your big rock truck. And how do you get the rock truck to where the you rock is? Drive. And then how do you get the rock truck so down you, to Bay 3? This is where I was saying it's the installation of all road and the location is critical because you got to get these rock trucks in. Even if they're not coming in and off the road, mm -hmm. they do have to come in once. Mm -hmm. So you're bringing the rock trucks in here, 
We drive down here, you stage one or two rock trucks up there with the big excavator and a big excavator on the foreshore. So as this is blasting, the excavator is putting, the excavator also has to be handling these massive blasting mass that are the size of this room. Yeah. So you drill a bunch of holes, lay a blasting mat on top of it, you light it off. Yeah. Matt goes up, picks the mat off, grabs the big rocks, puts them in the truck. And he's also separating all the gravel and crap mm -hmm. because that can be used as infill and backfill. Mm -hmm. Then he takes those rocks from this blasting site and he'll drive it down a road. And again, we're going to start, we'll, we'll start here and start and work away. My, my question was not the whole road across from the four, but the whole road across from the 10. Well, you wouldn't go that far. So you'd be blasting. Do you guys go back to that picture? Yeah. Yeah. So you'd, you'd be blasting in here and yeah. your whole road would be here. I'm having, had to, I'm having yeah. trouble envisaging a whole road across that part of that's all bedrock. Right? Yeah, you'd be you you blasting road over there. You blast it to make a hallway. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the option is like any, anywhere, you, over it. anywhere you want to go with a rock truck, you got to go 14 foot wide path. Yeah. That's three feet deep in rock. Yeah. So you have to lay down fire. Yeah, it's yeah. heavy Because it's going to sink, right? Right. So yeah. you're going to. But then that whole road that you just described is going through that habitat particular it's, area. We'll put that habitat circle back on. Yeah. So it would be coming down. It's coming here. Area. So you, in, by my best guess is you're going to take all this to generate the amount of rock you need. And the first thing you're going to do is blast in the hollow road. Yeah, so what, what typically we do for shorelines is... <clears throat> So the excavator is building his road as he's going, and that actually is the riprap at the end, right? So he's he's got a he's sitting on the rock dump rock, rock truck dumps right in front of him. He builds kind of like a road, and he's backing up as he goes, right? As the, and the, he's making a nice service for the rock truck as the rock truck is bringing the material. Then afterwards, once once all the material is placed, he goes back and then moves some of the haul road down onto the beach, right? So he then he has to do a little bit of double handling, but he would then rip up, take up some of his wide road, or it could just be capped with landscaping material, depending on what's more cost effective. So, because the essentially that rip wrap, the top of the rip wrap would be his shoreline toe or for his shoreline wheel. Right? You leave that, that slide up, guys, and just pan a little bit towards uh, Beach Drive in the third tee. I don't mind explaining it again because it's important. Like, this is the single most important part of this project, right? Is how you're going to get them out of there. Mm -hmm. So, again, like you could spend a bunch of money coming in across three fairways, and you're really not going to get any net benefit from it because you're going to spend $150,000 putting a road in here that you're not going to use. Mm -hmm. Or you could spend the money going in around tees and damaging this area and then fixing those and you'll be out. But in my mind, the best way to get in here is. Just follow the shoreline because you're going to be redoing it anyway. Mm -hmm. And you're generating your biggest material up here to use here. Your less smaller size material was here, and your smaller size material was here. So you're basically, like you said, you're back hauling it up and you're, you're mm -hmm. cleaning up the blasting site, you're digging up your stuff, your rock trucks are all the way and working your way back to your teeth. I think, guys, I think we really missed a potential problem on 3T in this whole design. If you look, you know where 3T is. Do you guys know where 3T is? It's over there. Uh, keep, coming come, keep coming down to the very bottom of the screen. Oh, right here. Sorry, yes. Yeah, that's six. Come down. Come oh, down. Zoom out. Yeah, yeah zoom out. Okay. Yeah. Down that's to the, right, right yep, down to the right. bottom center of the bottom center. That's right five, here. four. No, keep coming yeah. a little more. That's five. That's yeah. four green, four green, see four green, just above your mouse. Yes, right here. And next to it is 3T. Yes, right. Sure. That beach, that beach and that bay is really low, guys. Like, I think we, we kind of missed not fixing that spot. I, again, you know, if the third T gets flooded and washed away, I guess it's not the most expensive piece of property, but. No, There's... I think the study, the original study didn't identify this as a high area of risk, but. It, this definitely could be incorporated. I think we did talk about that at one point, looking at doing some work in here or using it as a habitat offset area. 
Uh, I have one comment though, Aaron. So that, because there's so much room of unused territory there, you can do all your works above high water. You don't need to get into DFO. You could do your ar armoring upland because mm -hmm. they're not really exactly. care about the scrubby brush, right? No. Yeah, you just, you know, that's your dump site. So there's some major dump sites, right? Like you dump a ton of this size of rock. So from say, it's called one foot minus or 12 inch minus. So it's from 12 inches down to whatever gets dumped there. A big pile of it gets dumped there. And then you create a nice mound that separates three T and four green. You just have to look again. Another reason why you want every bit of your work kind of more focused on the tree because mm -hmm. we're coming across trees one and five. You don't have anywhere to dump anything. You're going to just take the field for parking lot. Plus, you have to restore three four and five's irrigation system, drainage system, and then match the sod. It's just going to stick out like the sweat box. No, I don't know what you're just That creature will be converted. But yeah. Yeah. So, just getting into the area where the site of where you're harvesting the rock. You're going to go up to the right of the fifth green and into that rock that there's pretty yeah. steep, but you're blasting it out yeah. and using the excavator to yeah. build the road to, as it goes up and in. Yeah. And like and I said, the, the first 10 feet for sure of that rock is going to turn to dust as soon as you lost yeah. it. Yeah. And all that, you just take an excavator and comb it down. An excavator could get up there the way it is right now. No problem. Yes. But I mean, might as well make the road of the material and then we just take it out as we go. I've got tons of slides on how we did seven. Yeah. And we can go through that at a later date. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But yeah, guys, sorry, as far as like scope, I just wanted to like plant some things in your head that you know, puzzle you <laughs> so that you can think of like what the club needs. Obviously, there's like a few different ways we can do it. I think this is just the one we set on maybe the least disturbance. But the logistics obviously, you know, can be ironed out and alternatives can be thought of too. I just wanted to make sure everybody's thinking about it, that's all. So, and you know, because now is the best time to start thinking about alternatives if that method is not favorable to the club, you know, like blasting the hill and moving it over. If we want to do something else, we kind of want to just plan it early. Um, yeah, I think also, Tim, you can say if a construction project is going on in OK within six months of when we're doing this project, then we can acquire the rock. So for example, oh, oh. Had, we, had we gone ahead with it this year, the Jaws were blasting rock on the avenue, they would have given us all the rock we needed for this but we have to find the yeah. project that's yeah. going on. And yeah. if that happens, then yeah. it would have be right? That's just a, a, a positive bonus, mm -hmm. bonus yeah. possibility. Yeah. Yeah, uh, like you, you might get lucky and someone's got a whole bunch of rock that you've got to get rid of. And, you know, they're going to be paying you of it otherwise. So, you know, but yeah, I wouldn't bank on that. I budget for the scenario where you got to make your own rock because you don't want to be disappointed later. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. For sure. You can't depend yeah. on that. Yeah. yeah. Any, any more questions? So, we can discuss. Mm -hmm. so I, sorry, I have one more comment, Rob. Uh, so, just on that point, the bigger, I don't like, I don't always like bigger construction firms, but the one advantage of big construction firms is because they have so many projects is they have a lot more opportunities for those kinds of things, mm -hmm. right? So they might be like, oh, geez, we're blasting the whole subdivision over here. And so that's, so it would be good maybe to bring in a few different, you know, vendors that are a little bigger because on the bidding side, just so that, you know, they might be off, they, they just have more access to material and stuff, so. Yeah, originally we were going to use MCN excavating, but he's downsized pretty substantially. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, fired all the steps, so that's good. It's good fire to do with people. Next step series, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, uh, do you want our timeline is the AGM is when? We don't know. Yeah. We don't know. We're voting April. So then, say if it's April twenty fourth, April twenty fifth, we'd be pulling you to give it away. Okay. Okay. Do you still want us to present on uh, the twenty first or? Present that... on the first at yeah. the next meeting. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. And it'll be less, probably less than this. We won't. We'll be a little faster. Okay. okay. We can't. Uh, we can't control. Uh, members of the committee who might have questions for you, but um, I, I think we should try and control the amount of time that we have available to the 
this item on the agenda. Let's put it that way. Because okay. otherwise, it will, it will spiral out of control. Yeah, we'll yeah. do from 4 30 to 5. Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll give you guys half an hour. Um, That's good. And uh, we're, we're hoping that, that you will spend a good bit of that time informing the committee. And then uh, a smaller amount of time would be available for questions. Yeah, happy to. Thanks, guys. I'm sorry to keep uh, asking all these questions, but I think through this, we're getting better and better every time. Yeah. But uh, not a problem. Appreciate your time. Thanks yeah, very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron.